I want to read three headlines. Just want to read three headlines that I think will sort of set the stage for what we're going to talk about here for the next little bit. I generally start my talks by reading three headlines from that morning's news and then relate each one to a larger theme that I'm going to talk about. The second headline actually is also from this morning's journal. It says, U.S. executives remain pessimistic. Great. Here's what it says. The audience really seems to appreciate that somebody got up early that morning and did a fair amount of work for them. The best part about what I do at Fortune is that I get a 360 degree view of what's happening in the business climate. I am constantly learning about the largest issues going on any place and I'm learning about them from the people who are making things happen. Jamie Dimon here next to me, Chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Mutar Kent is Chairman and CEO of the Coca-Cola Company. Yuan Ching Yang is Chairman and CEO of Lenovo Group. I get to talk to the business leaders of great corporations, the entrepreneurs who are going to disrupt business, to the government leaders who are going to help shape the environment for all of these businesses, and of course to consumers and others who are buying or not buying the goods and services from those businesses. Our topic is winning in a friction-free world. This is something we're going to be hearing a lot more about. Labor, information, and money move easily, cheaply, and almost instantly in a friction-free economy. Every organization and every person can possess the 21st century's most valuable assets openness to new ideas, ingenuity, and imagination. The best companies, the most successful companies, will see it as a huge opportunity because they can be that competitor who comes out of nowhere. That's why a friction-free economy is bottom line more opportunity than ever in history. Every business, I don't care what business you're in, is in danger of being disrupted by a competitor they never even thought of. The disruption that can happen to a company in no time is like nothing we have ever seen before. Earlier this year, the largest taxi co-op in San Francisco filed for bankruptcy, and we know why, right? We all know why because somebody innovated that business model and it wasn't them. Uber has a business model that doesn't require as much capital. It's the largest ride service in the world and it doesn't own any cars. Another thing that's going to last for a long time, geopolitical unrest. What's new is that there is instability among the great powers, US, China, Russia, that didn't used to be there. I'm at the Fortune Global Forum in Guangzhou, where I'm moderating several of the sessions. Attendees here include Apple CEO Tim Cook, Ford Motor Chairman Bill Ford, Walmart Chairman Greg Penner, Alibaba founder and CEO Jack Ma, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and many others. One big message is coming through here. The clear message from the government officials is, China is open for business, welcoming businesses from all over the world, especially entrepreneurs, and promising them a level playing field. Every business leader I've spoken to here agrees this is a clear effort to fill the void being left by the United States, which is perceived as closing itself off from the world. Every business person has to confront and embrace the fact that government's playing a larger role in our business lives. And it's not going to go back to the way it was. Our topic is business versus government. Uh, recognizing the fact that every business, and particularly this industry, the tech industry broadly defined, is very heavily influenced by government policy. And there's been an awful lot of talk about which of those policies are good and which are bad. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Getting ahead of those trends is a real challenge for every business, and I don't care who you are, what business you're in. 
We can't be paralyzed and think that we can wait for things to settle down. It's not going to happen. The way the best leaders are doing it, they innovate their business model, they manage for value, they build their human capital, and they get radically customer-centric. From where I sit, I get to see a lot of early indicators that really tell us where the economy is going. Is it going to be more consumer-focused, more savings-focused, more export-focused? I can take these bits and pieces that I get from leaders all around the world and put together a coherent view of where the economy is going. Our ability to predict what's going to happen for some reason is much worse than it used to be. So let's see what's happening now in the environment, the political environment that affects our business on issues that affect corporate interests most strongly. So today we did get, as promised, uh, at least the outline of the big tax proposal from the administration. Uh, uh, Steve Mnuchin and Gary Cohn had a briefing with the press uh, at 1.30 this afternoon and presented you know, the outlines. Now, it's just the outlines. This is really just bullet points, and we don't know the details yet. So he here's what we know, but then here's what we don't know and really need to know before we can start making judgments about how it's going to affect us. The pessimists have always been wrong. Optimism has always been the right way to bet, and that's the way I'm betting, and I hope you are too. For 500 years, the scarce resource in business was financial capital. It no longer is, even for capital-intensive companies. For all of us, the scarce resource is human capital. My new book is called Humans Are Underrated, and it arose out of an article I wrote for the Fortune 500 issue of Fortune, which began with the question, in the economy of five or 10 years from now, what will people do better than computers. We are entering an era where the skills that our economy values highly are changing in a historic way that we'll get to here in a second. Over and over, we're seeing technology taking over jobs that people used to do. Now, people will still be valuable, but we had better figure out what skills the economy will value as we go forward from here, because those are the ones that we have to get world-class great at. What will people do better than computers? The traditional approach to answering this question is to ask, well, what is it that computers just inherently cannot do? Don't ask what computers can't do, because over and over, the answers are wrong. Instead, ask what humans are most driven to do. What are they? Well, that's becoming clear too. What we must do, even if a computer can do it too, empathize is the foundation of all else. Working in groups, telling stories, solving problems creatively, building relationships. These skills, the skills of human interaction, are going to be the most valuable. Talent is Overrated is a book about great performance, and not just really good performance, but great performance, world-class great performance, and where it really comes from. This is not a bunch of my opinions about where great performance comes from. There's 30 years of good research on it, which most people really are not well aware of. The term world-class great gets thrown around pretty easily, but in fact, Increasingly, we all have to be world-class great because we're competing with everyone in the world. Standards are rising. If you really believe that you must have this natural one in a million gift to be great at something, then when you encounter the roadblocks, you will take it as evidence that you don't have that gift. But if you really believe that those roadblocks can be overcome, that by doing the deliberate practice, you can get past them, then you have at least a chance of becoming world-class great. This basic idea of how we get to be great performers is inherently fascinating, and we're in an environment that is more competitive, 
no matter what business you're in, no matter what your role in the business is, we have to be better performers. We're in global competition. And so this message is especially relevant and frankly, it's only getting more relevant with every day. The message that comes out of this is finally incredibly liberating. Great performance is not reserved for a preordained few. It is available to you and to everyone. After I speak about talent is overrated, I am still stunned by some of the responses I get from audience members who come up to talk afterwards, and lots of them do. One of the things is the greatest performers, when I speak to people who are terrific performers, they seem to embrace this message the most. I once spoke about this topic to an audience of a thousand brain surgeons. Okay, so you talk about intimidating, well that was my audience. Now, afterwards we did a book signing and I talked to people. They were lined up out the door, literally. They wanted to talk about this. Even though they were already fantastic performers, they understood better than most how true it is and they really wanted to get that message. I've been so lucky to interview so many prominent, famous, fascinating people on stage. Both Presidents Bush, Tony Blair, Prince of Wales, uh, three Secretaries of State, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, Madeleine Albright, actually four, Henry Kissinger, uh, Bill Gates, Jack Welch, Ted Turner, Richard Branson. It's a long list and it has been a privilege to talk to them. I do have a specific way of preparing and conducting these interviews. I do a huge amount of research ahead of time, as you might imagine, but I don't make a specific plan for the interview because I've got to follow that conversation where it goes. The most important skill is listening to what that person is really saying and responding to it, not just reading my list of questions, and also sensing how the audience is responding to this. My whole objective is to make this interesting and valuable for the audience. I want to bring out from that person across from me stuff that will be memorable, that those folks will talk about for days or weeks or months after we're done. Good morning, I'm Jeff Colvin of Fortune. Our topic is jobs for the 21st century. And that video did a pretty good job of setting it up. The world of work is in transition and it's radical. Many people blame technology for loss of jobs, for stagnating incomes. Many other people blame globalization for it. For the first time ever, there is serious debate among informed people about whether technology will create more jobs than it eliminates. The one thing we know for sure is that jobs are going to change dramatically in the coming years. They're already changing. And what that means for companies as well as employees and societies, that's our topic. We have two terrific panelists to talk with us about it. You know, I love speaking. I just love doing it. And I think what I love the most about it is learning all the stuff I learn from doing this. And it starts well before the event. You know, we do a lot of preparation for these events. And I am on a lot of conference calls. The hard work always pays off we get a better result at the event if we have put in the work ahead of time to prepare for it.